Eric Orwall has done an interesting video, um, kind of in tune with the general thrust of a few of his other recent videos, and he's discussing an issue that a lot of people, I think, are uncomfortable with. And in a sense, it strikes me that, that he's promoting a certain point of view. Now, I may be misreading him because a lot of people think that I'm promoting a certain point of view as well, and, well, I don't think I am, or I don't mean to, um, so I don't want to sort of straw man him here. Um, and the issue, uh, the latest video, is um, Master Race. Um, I'm fascinated by the entire idea because society always seems to have developed along the lines of an aristocracy and everybody else. Um, the hoi polloi um, in ancient Greek were the many. Now the, uh, the hoi polloi in modern English, especially I guess in the UK, in snottier circles, the hoi polloi are the great unwashed. They're inferior to everyone else, whereas in the ancient Greek, the hoi polloi were simply uh, the many. That's all that that really meant. Um, having said that, though, the Greeks had very, very clear ideas on aristocracy. Aristoi was the, the best, the, uh, the beautiful, the um, noble, all this sort of thing kind of like the way the ancient Aryans saw themselves. Um, <clears throat> so they did really believe in human quality. They did believe in superior and inferior people, and in particular, the ancient Greeks deeply admired Sparta. Um, we sort of are more obsessed with the Athenians, but if you asked most ancient Greeks who they really liked, it would have, would have been the Spartans who they looked up to. Um, now, that's an interesting point of view because it, it gives you a, a historical perspective on and, and an intellectual apology for um, master morality, which Nietzsche ran across when he came up with his ideas, or Hegel or whoever it was, of um, slave and master dialectic or slave and master morality. Um, I am inclined, and the more I delve into the entire issue, to think not so much that slave and master are inferior or superior to each other, um, but that they are simply two very different ways of seeing life. Um, per perspectivism, a Nietzschean idea, uh, there are virtually limitless ways of looking at everything. Um, and a master point of view, the master's point of view, is simply one of many ways, and the slave's point of view is simply one of many ways. And it was just the starkness of it all that came out so clearly when you read the ancient classics in an age of liberalism or resurgent liberalism like that of Nietzsche and Hegel, um, that it somebody was blatantly challenging the idea of human equality, which was really coming to the forefront in the 19th century, the utilitarian idea. And Nietzsche was rebelling against utilitarianism, and utilitarianism is often seen as a hallmark of a slave morality or a slave point of view. Now, I don't see slave morality as inferior to a master morality or a master view of the world or whatever. I don't see it that way at all. I simply see it as a different way. Um, because if you look at it in a certain way, um, when becoming the master becomes an end in itself, then you get all kinds of nasty stuff. You get all kinds of petty nasty stuff. You get um, people who say that, well, this used to be a country for real men type thinking. And, you know, now that it's all been, we've all been hemmed in by stupid laws and rules and everything like that. And the idea is now to get back to what we really are, etc., etc. Um, that has serious dangers in and of itself. I like reading the tantrics and the esoterics and all these people. And, and then mid-20th century, or the early 20th century, a lot of these people who were into um, ancient uh, Eastern views of things were often, well, fascists. <laughs> um, and we know where fascism can lead. Now, I'm not even saying that a beehive state or whatever with the more um, eligible people running the show is a bad idea. I'm just saying that becoming the most eligible person and maintaining that position 
as an end in itself is not the sign of a master. If you ask me, that's almost the sign of a slave, because the slave simply wants to be the best of all the other slaves. The true master is, in, in my opinion, the ubermensch, which is the overman, which is the person who is outside of all of it. He doesn't want to be part of the herd, nor does he want to be the sheepdog. He simply wants to say, this is something that I'm transcending. Uh, I don't want to be, as I say, the sheep or the sheepdog. I want to be me. So, <clears throat> I think that master morality and master slave dialectic and all this sort of thing, at least in terms of the way I understand it, and perhaps I'm disagreeing with Nietzsche here, and I don't care. I'll disagree with anybody. Um, I'm th I think that it's not that this is a better way or that this is a desirable position to be in in life or that it's, it's something that a human being should promote in their life to become an aristocrat or above everybody else because then you're simply competing with other people in a life which is nothing more than a game of king of the hill writ large I'm better than you are type thing the overman simply transcends all of that he says this has nothing to do with me anymore I am an individual I am myself nobody gets to call me anything except me I own myself. Now, my reading of Nietzsche and a lot of other people who think along these lines tends to sort of corroborate this, because I don't think that Nietzsche, who was a sickly little man, um, never married, never did anything terribly vigorous, or at least later in life, I guess earlier on he was a cavalry trooper, which is pretty vigorous, but he couldn't handle that. But anyway, um, I don't think he was really trying to say that um, being a slave is toxic and being a master is liberating. I think, I think he was simply saying that there are other ways to view these things and there is no fixed way, no correct way to see things. And this is where ideas of you know, elitism, um, conspiracies of elitism or elitist conspiracies or um, the elect or the aristocrats or the the peers or whatever kind of falls down because again that was what the Spartans kind of ended up getting criticized for as well um, the Spartan was only really himself when he was pushing other people around type thing he wasn't really um, as noble as you think once you actually got to know him it, it, it overtly he looked noble because the Spartans were notorious or notable for being extremely good-looking people extremely refined in their manners or I suppose refined in their manners in terms of the tastes of the time. Um, they were um, supposedly better educated, all this sort of thing, than everybody else. Um, that's just the overt thing. When you read the literature of the ancients, the Spartans are often shown as not really all that um, admirable once you actually get to know them. They tend to be kind of brutes and arrogant and, and even stupid. Um, <clears throat> So I don't think that, that the master idea is necessarily a good idea, and I don't think that the slave point of view is necessarily a bad idea. I think it's simply that this is how society tends to devolve if, if there's no actual intervention to switch things. If nobody actually challenges the social order, it ends up always looking like something of a pyramid. It's not that, that this is a desirable thing, it just seems to be the way of things. Um, and within that the idea of a society as a pyramid, there are different ways of viewing that society, which means that there are different ways of viewing the human condition and each of our, each of our position in it. I don't think that the master's position is something that must be defended, preserved, promoted, or whatever, and I don't think that the slave position is something to be avoided, anathematized, or degraded in any way at all. Um, I think that they are simply different ways of looking at things, um, different views of reality. If um, you were to go and move among the underclass of whatever society that you live in, uh, the uneducated, the disenfranchised, perhaps an ethnically based underclass, 
or um, racially based underclass or whatever, um, you would see that they have a very different view of what the world is than people who are not part of that underclass. That's it's, it's a tough sort of um, nut to crack. This view of life from the I don't know bottom of the pyramid. And it's equally difficult for somebody in my position to see it from the top, because I've never been on the top. I've never been an aristocrat, but I've never been in the underclass either. I've moved among both, actually, in my life, and that's a rare thing for people, but I have actually done it. And I find each of them have pratfalls of their own, and I find that being, say, an aristocrat or whatever would, would in my opinion, be a, a species of slavery, in, in my opinion, because I have to do all these things and to get along with all the other aristocrats and the other mem members of the elect or the chosen or whatever you want to call them, and I don't want to have anything to do with that, thank you very much. I, I am me. I'm not you guys out there. I'm not part of some caste or whatever. Um, maybe as society devolves, I'm a member of the lower middle class in Canada, um, but that's not because I've actively pursued that position. It's just that's the way my my life seems to have panned out. Um, <clears throat> so, is one better than the other? Eric Orwell seems to be promoting the idea that there is um, there is a way we can actually grade um, master and slave points of view that one is superior to the other. Interestingly, and I see a, f a fair amount of this in recently, and Eric, don't take this the wrong way because I'm not painting you this way, but among what, what are colloquially and somewhat incorrectly called the extreme right these days, um, Christian identity and all this sort of thing, um, where it's alleged that, you know, God, guns, and guts made this country great, and it's the loss of all the three of these that are causing all the trouble, and you kind of get a picture of somebody who would have that bumper sticker on their pickup truck, what that person is like. Basically, he says that, uh, essentially, white Northern European Christians once made a great country, and now look what's happening when all the other people who aren't like us, even if they are white, but they're not Christian, they're not us, as it were, they're ruining it all. <coughs> Um, really, um, did the people who made the country great, allegedly, actually see themselves as a member of the elect, as a member of the tribe or something like this that were actually making a, a difference in the world? And if they did, how did that color their views with everybody else? What did they actually think about black people? What did they actually think about um, non-Christians? What did they actually think about non Western people. Read H.P. Lovecraft and a lot of people will say that the entire thrust of that is his absolute subconscious revulsion with anybody who wasn't a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Ironically, his wife was Jewish, but when you see her pictures, she's a bit of a little, little nice-looking little kitten, so I wouldn't really blame him for <laughs> losing his head over her, but um, I guess bigotries only go so deep because there are other subconscious drives that motivate us. But <clears throat> is there actually an advantage, an absolute advantage, not relative advantages, to being an aristocrat? And is being a slave an absolute disadvantage? Now, if you know what slavery actually is, you can see that real slavery is not something somebody would want to actually fall into. Real slavery could simply never be portrayed in the movies or anything else because it would be considered such hardcore, hellish pornogra pornography and filth that it could never get past any censor, even in the most liberal of countries. Um, so it's hard to imagine that anybody would ever say that living as a sexually abused, starved, bullied, beaten uh, human person, human being rather, uh, could in any way be seen as a good position. Um, arguably as well, though, um, being an absolute master is to be an absolute slave. I've, I'm sort of interested in the story of Joseph Stalin. I've done kind of a study of his life for all of my adult life, and he strikes me as a man whose life was a failure as well, even though he had absolute power, absolute wealth. He basically owned everybody and everything in the communist world. Um, he, was the, he was essentially a living god in, in the old Soviet Union in the Eastern Bloc. And I would say his life was a failure. Why? Because he was a slave. His entire existence was devoted to maintaining his power. 
Now, Nietzsche would have said, of course it was, because power is all that really matters. I'm not really sure even if Nietzsche, if you get into it, um, if Nietzsche actually seems to really um, say that in absolute terms, power is everything. I think, or at least the way I read it, it's that he's saying that there's other wills in, out there. Um, he's sort of rebelling against the idea that the will to life is all that there is. He's saying, no, no, a lot of other people are interested in other things far more than life and survival and, and, and whatever. They want to actually flourish. They want to actually be the king of the hill. They want to increase their power and their influence over others, over nature, over themselves, over all this sort of thing. That I can understand, but that's simply another perspective. You've got to remember, you must always, I think, include perspectivism in any sort of um, any sort of analysis of what Nietzsche is saying, because in some ways yes, in some ways no. Um, when power simply becomes an end in itself, it can become an addiction, just like life can. So, but and, and and power isn't the only will that there is out there. There's the will to meaning. There's the will to joy. The will to life. The will to um, knowledge. All this sort of thing. Um, the will to power might be the most obvious one in an age where you know the news and politics and battles and everything are so much more um, more um, pronounced than they were, say, in other ages. Uh, like now, like whenever you read the newspapers or check the media, it's always about some political event, some war or whatever, and, or some f financial issue in, involving rich people and this sort of thing. You get the impression that these people are absolutely superior to other people and that news about wars and battles and power and everything is absolutely more important. I don't think so. I think it's simply different perspectives, and it's it was the it was a reaction against the idea that we only exist in order to exist. We have no other purpose than just to exist, which is you know kind of what Schopenhauer said. So, in any case, being a master might be, in many senses, a desirable thing. But if it's an end in itself or a goal in itself, I would say that, in a sense, that is a species of slavery masquerading as being a master. The scene from Rome, the original TV series, the first season, where um, Pompey looks down at his slave kneeling in the mud on the beach, take, waiting to take his uh, every word down in a dictation. He looks at the slave and he goes, how nice it must be to be a slave. And you're you know, you're left with that sense of irony that, yeah, sure, Pompey, you you want to switch places with him? Go right ahead. You know, how, how nice it must be to be a slave. You never have to worry about anything. Every decision you ever have to make is made for you. You never have to even think. You may have met people that are actually seem, that actually seem to be like this. I don't want to think. Please hand me my reality, and I'll simply deal with it. I'll simply play by the rules that others have set for me. I think that Pompey, in a sense, well, not just in a sense, but is actually wrong there, that he really doesn't want to switch places with the slave kneeling in the mud. But he's making an interesting point. It's lonely at the top, and being on top really isn't all that it's cracked up to be when you get up there. Um, unless, of course, it's not necessarily an end in itself, and you simply are that way. That, traditionally, is the mark of a true aristocrat. Someone who just by being themselves gravitates to the top, not somebody whose ambitions take them there. I think there's a very, very, very important distinction that the distinction that lies at the very heart of placing any value on master or slave positioning. <laughs>